transition. Okay. We are finishing up our sermon series here. The last four weeks we've called From Crisis to Christ. Um, we've, we've looked at four issues uh, that we've seen or I've seen that have gotten maybe worse or, or magnified or kind of come to our attention over the last couple of years because of uh, the COVID pandemic. We've talked about high emotions, anxiety, We've talked about division, how it's affected our kids, and if you've, you've missed any one of these, uh, you can go on to our website and find it uh, by video or by, by podcast. But in each one of these topics, we've, we've looked at how Jesus Christ gives us hope, um, freedom, healing in the midst of these specific topics, but really for any kind of crisis we go through. So we talked about from going from anxiety to peace in Christ, or kids who are influenced by our culture to kids that we disciple, or last week looking at Jesus' prayer in John 17 for unity from division in our country to unity in Christ. And this morning, um, we're going to talk about from socially distanced to meeting together. So I'm going to invite up Tad Stoner. Uh, We've had somebody different come and read our passage each Sunday. And so you can follow along on the screen or open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 19 to 25. As we look at our passage, it talks about meeting together and what that means for us today. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast, with, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Thanks, Tad. I forgot to mention, too, the reason why I have two cups here this morning is because if you turn in your Connect cards, you get a free mug over at the welcome table. Uh, For each one of these sermons, we've looked first at the negative, and then the, the positive. We look first at kind of what has happened the last couple of years, some of the, the crisis, you might call it, and then looked at Christ. And for each one of these things, the last four weeks, the first, the first one is always going to be a little bit shorter, and the second one, as we dive into the scriptures together, will be longer. So, point one this morning, the new normal, socially distanced Zoom meetings. And that's, that's kind of how I pictured saying it as I, I wrote it out this last week in this kind of not very fun, condescending, socially distant Zoom meetings. Yes. I don't even like saying that phrase because it's so used the past couple of years, but the new normal. How many times have you heard that the last couple of years? That this is the new normal we have, and now there's a newer, newer normal that we have. But the last couple of years, not only have we you know, lived through this COVID thing, but it's caused some differences. March 2020, we had to be distanced from each other for a while, right? That phrase, social distancing, became very common to think about how we we're still supposed to be social and to be around each other, but had to be distanced from each other. And so for many people, that took the place in Zoom meetings or maybe FaceTiming or other digital video calls, that kind of thing. Uh, How many of you here, like on a regular basis, you are still involved in in Zoom meetings in some way or other? Okay. Um, I remember very early on, that was a huge part of of my job, connecting with people was over the phone or Zoom meetings. And the, the phrase Zoom fatigue was, was, became really true in my own life. Even this past year when I was doing a, a, a chaplaincy program here 
in town. I was involved with people kind of all over the state in Illinois, and so I had to do two, three-hour Zoom meetings a week, which was a long time, right? There's something different about being digital with somebody. We were, we were distanced, we were videoed. Um, even for a time, we had to limit our gatherings. I remember this last, well, this last week I, I looked back and saw some videos that we had made early on talking about coming back into the sanctuary here for worship and the chairs very spread out and, and, and kind of being six feet apart or that kind of thing. We had size limitations of who, how many could gather inside, how much time together. Um, even mass became very common in our society, right? And that was a difference that we didn't have before in terms of being uh, distanced from each other. Or if you happened to get quarantined or a family member, you had to be quarantined. If you had COVID, you had to be quarantined, which meant being isolated. So more Zoom meetings and phone calls and FaceTime. And there were all kinds of issues of, of, of loneliness and new normal and all those things. And I say all of that because I think it has affected even what it means for us as Christians today. Some of these things we've talked about, our kids or anxiety, they, they have lasted. And we've come now, at least in you know, the last few months and year, to meet back together and not as many masks. But I think there are still effects from that, even with our online viewership, to think about what does it mean to be the church and to meet together. And so as Tad read, we are commanded, we are encouraged to meet together. This passage here talks about uh, stirring one another up to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And so as we now turn to our second point, this point will be in for scripture, it is this idea of we are to meet together. Now, as I said earlier during communion, the whole book of Hebrews is not an easy book. The entire, I mean, story of Hebrews is, is really put into three words. Jesus is better. You can just look through kind of the, the, the chapter titles of Hebrews 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 10, and it's always talking about how Jesus is better than uh, the Old Testament uh, sacrifices or the, the priests or, or Moses. He's, he's speaking to Jewish Christians of the day. It's really deep, hard theology, but, but, it, but it talks about for us how did Jesus complete, fulfill, how is he better than those things? And so, as he's been talking about in chapter 10, these, these sacrifices of the Old Testament, that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. I love this alliteration that he talks about that I read earlier, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. But when Christ is offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, that's Hebrews 10, 12, he sat down. I was thinking of this last night. I am so thankful that we are past that as a church, as a culture, society, that I don't have to offer sacrifices for you anymore. I was walking back to my house last night from my, my neighbors and saw two bunny rabbits in my yard. I've been watching these rabbits because I planted a garden last weekend. And I've seen them around I'm just watching them, and I figured out where their I don't know, bunny burrow is. It's like 15 feet from my garden, right under our slide. And so I'm laying in bed last night thinking, do I have to, like, kill these bunny rabbits? <laughs> I heard a bunch of no's out there, like, no, don't do that but I need to protect my garden. But this is what I'm thinking in my head last night, like about these bunny rabbits, what am I going to do with these things? But I am so glad that my job not anymore is to offer sacrifices, to kill things for you to come to God. That was the Old Testament. But Jesus said, 
I come as the perfect once and for all sacrifice offered for one time. And it's because of that, that then finally in verse 19, chapter 10, this author says this, that we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. It should not make us confident to think about being in the presence of somebody holy or majestic or perfect. I mean, God himself, because we are not that by any means. We are, we are sinful. We know that, right? But here he says we have confidence then. We can go up to God with, with confidence because of the blood that Jesus shed by the, the, the new, the living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a, a great, a better priest over the house of God, let us draw Near. Let's have confidence with a true heart and faith and assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled, washed. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. So Christ's sacrifice, this is the point two, saved us for this new community. And the first thing that he shows us is this new community was made by Christ's sacrifice. We have this confidence because of Christ. Don't have to have fear or anxiety or any of that to come into God's presence. Now, this is great for us individually, right? We think about this often as American. This is me, my, my time with God. But notice all of the times that he makes this about us in this passage, He's talking to a group. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence, or verse 20, he opened for us, verse 21, since we have a great priest, or verse 22, let us draw near with our hearts sprinkled and our bodies washed. Let us hold fast of our hope without wavering. I mean, he's, he's so interested in the entire group, the, the church, the us, the our, the we. This is not just about you and God. This is about us. Christ saved you for a new community now and forever. There, there are no Lone Ranger Christians there are no Christians that were not made for the church. And my fear is the last couple of years have ingrained in some of us that, well, I don't need church. I don't need the body. I don't need the community or meeting together that much. I can sleep in or I can, uh, you know, I'll watch online next week or it's just not that important. But what he's saying here is that it is through Christ's sacrifice that he then provided a new way for us to be together now and forever. And then he gets into these, kind of what I call these, these, these salad passages, these let us. Let us draw near. Let us hold fast. And then what we're going to focus on now is verse 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So first, in this idea of us, we are to stir up one another for good. We were made for community. Way back in the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2, when God is making human beings, he makes man first, and he says to Man, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. He's talking to Adam about Eve and this marriage relationship. But he's also talking in general about all of us, that we were created, we were made to not be alone. It's so interesting in Genesis 1 and 2 that as God is making things, he says, this is good, this is good, this is good. And then finally in Genesis 2, it says, this is not good that man should be alone. He has made us for community. Last week, we looked at John 17, where Jesus is praying for us 
And he talks about us being invited into the fellowship of the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that we were made, created, not just for fellowship with each other, but fellowship with God, community with God himself. We're, we're going to go visit some, some friends this, this next week, Matt and Aaron. Uh, Aaron is, is very extroverted, and Matt is very introverted. Who, who are my extroverts out there? Okay, introverts, I'm not even going to talk to you. Just, just stay where you are. I know you. But they would talk about in, their, in their, their marriage that every once in a while, Aaron just needed to, like, go somewhere. And so Matt would take her to the mall and just walk around and, like, meet people and be around people. I think both of us extroverts and introverts, we need people, right? But we were made for community. There was a study that was done, took participants uh, to spend time by themselves in a room. And it said participants typically did not enjoy it, spending even 6 to 15 minutes in a room by themselves with nothing to do but to think. Many preferred to administer electric shocks to themselves instead of being left alone with their thoughts. This is not great, men, for us, but in fact, many of the people studied, particularly the men, chose to give themselves a mild electric shock rather than be deprived of external sensory stimuli. There's something in us that, that craves, that needs, that wants community. Loneliness, being alone, makes you vulnerable to addiction, distorts your thinking. I, I've been encouraged so much by this phrase, the opposite of addiction is connection. And so here the author tells us, the church today, that we are to do something positive first. We are to stir up one another for good. It's this phrase of agitation or excitement to spur on, as some translations say, or to stir up or to poke at or to encourage somebody else for love and good deeds. I have really enjoyed coffee over the past couple of years. That's been one of my um, COVID projects is buying more coffee things. And one of my newest coffee things that I bought was a milk frother. It has changed my life. I mean, I, I make breves and lattes in the morning or afternoon or evening or whenever I want to. It's great. But what a frother does is it, it takes regular milk and it heats it up and it stirs it to create something amazing. Frothy goodness milk. There's probably a better term for it than that. But that's what it's supposed to do in our own community is we stir one another up, encourage each other, not in a negative kind of beat you down, make you feel bad for not doing something, but it's supposed to be a, an encouraging kind of a way that we are to be in each other's lives, to know each other well enough that that's your spiritual gift. I want to encourage you in that to continue to be loving, continue to have good deeds, and to be in this community. And number three, we are to commit to our new community. He says this positive thing first. We're to you know, stir up, to encourage one another. And then he says in verse 25, but, but do not neglect to meet together as is the habit of some. So we're to commit to our new community. So one, make meeting together a habit. The habit of the early church was to meet often. This is from Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This is just describing the early church. They devoted themselves, the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship. They devoted themselves to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers and 
awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the pro proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, or daily, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day, daily, those who are being saved. So the habit, the, the regular thing for them then was to meet together every single day, whether it was in, in the temple, in their homes, in the community, they're praising God, they're sharing possessions, but it became the habit then of some of those people to stop that. They talk earlier on in Hebrews about some, some persecution that may have happened. So maybe they were being persecuted so they couldn't meet. Maybe it was fear of that happening, or maybe because they had jobs and work. We're not really told why that became the habit. But I think that is a real, that's a real thing for us today too. To, as it says, be in the habit of neglecting to meet together. It's so, it's so weird to me to think about every single day. <laughs> I mean, our, our goal is, is once a week, right? Sunday morning we come. Or, or maybe it's once a month for you, or maybe it's a few times a month. But there are so many reasons why we get out of the habit. I'm not just saying church Sunday morning, but just the community of believers, you know, maybe you just, you, you had a late night on Saturday. Maybe you want to sleep in. Maybe there's, there's brunch on Sunday morning. Maybe there's family stuff or, or traveling or sports. I was talking to my neighbor last night, and um, they were talking about how they have two boys, and, and they, you know, were both at different places yesterday, and they had to leave by 8 a.m. this morning for different places today to go to, and I feel like sometimes I get I kind of compete with other families my age for like, oh, how busy are you? Well, we're really busy. Like in April, we had like five different sports and activities going on with our three kids. And I, I know sports take over lives. Or maybe you, you work a lot. Or maybe you're like, well, Kevin's going on sabbatical this, this summer, so I'm just going to give up on church too. And I realized like how ironic and strange it is for me to be preaching on meeting together and then I'm leaving on sabbatical tomorrow. It wasn't really planned that way, but that's the way it worked out. There, there's so many excuses, so many reasons you could have to why not to meet for church or fellowship or community. But think about what he says here to make it a different habit, to not neglect that, to meet together even in person. I've heard from so many people that watched online for a long time, or some of you that watch online now, the idea of watching online church service. And the phrase I heard so often was, that it's, it's, it's not the same. It's not the same as being here together and, and hearing other people sing songs, hearing kids talking, being able to take communion together or hear the word together in person. This is always interesting. In Second John 1, 12, he says, Though I have much to write you, I would rather not use paper and ink. That was their technology then. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. I was trying so hard to find it this last week when we were coming back uh, from being distance and not having church, I made a video for our church encouraging people to come back, and I was just excited and talking about, oh, it's be so good to see people and to talk to you face to face, and some weird comment came out like, I can't wait to like see your skin again too, and it was a live video, and I couldn't take it back as I said it and knew like, oh, that's weird and creepy, but, uh, <laughs> but there's something about being in person and meeting together that is good and healthy. Number two, under this idea of 
um, committing to our new community is that encourage one another to come to our community. That's what he says at 25, but encouraging one another. If you have friends or family that you haven't seen in a while that, that are part of this community, that are part of you know, worship, call them, talk to them, invite them, text them right now even to come. And then number three, he says, know that our forever community is coming soon. He gives us encouragement. He says, you know, encourage one another because all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day he's talking about is this end times, that Jesus is coming back soon. And this, we're going to be together forever in community. We have this forever community in heaven that is coming. And as Revelation talks about this great multitude of nations and tribes and peoples and languages, that we will all be together. And so know that that day is coming and we can commit to that very thing even now. It is a strange thing for me to think about going on sabbatical. I'm excited to rest and to do some writing and just some, some really good time with God and the word and prayer, some family trips that we have planned to but I will miss you guys. I will miss praying with you and seeing your faces. And I, I look forward to when I get to come back. Uh, but I'm encouraged by the time that you guys will have together with other preachers and Dennis and Craig and others that will be here this summer with you. But let me encourage you with this. He says again, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. As we close up our, our message here and our service, we'll sing one more song, and I'm going to pray here, but during our last song, we're also going to take our offering. Offering and prayer and worship are all ways that we give back toward our awesome and amazing God in response to the word. And so let's do that now. Father, we thank you that you created us not just for a single relationship with you, but you created us to be with each other, to love each other, to encourage each other, to um, spur each other on to love and good deeds and to care for each other. Thank you for this family of believers that we have. And I pray for us now that we would invite others, as that Acts 2 passage talks about, that we would be added to day by day, that God, you would do an amazing work in this church and churches in the south side of Des Moines and Carlisle and this whole community, Lord, that you would do an amazing work of reinvigoration to know you more. Father, we just praise you, we, we love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.